This is an interview with Professor Bish Sanyal for the MIT 150 Infinite History Project. Professor Sanyal is a Ford International Professor of Urban Development and Planning and Director of the Special Program in Urban and Regional Studies and Humphreys Fellows Program at MIT. He first joined MIT in 1984 as an assistant professor and later served as the head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning from 1994 to 2002. He also served as the chair of the faculty at MIT from 2007 to 2009. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Professor Sanyal. Thank you. So let's start by talking a little bit about where you're from, your family background and your upbringing in India. Well, I was raised in, in Calcutta, in, in the state of West Bengal in India, and I went to school at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, which is like 80 kilometers from Calcutta. Um, and I pretty much stayed there till I finished my undergraduate and then came back to Calcutta for two years to work with my dad, who was a civil engineer and had his own construction business. He built bridges yeah. around the eastern part of India and also even outside. So I worked with him for two years and then I left for a master's degree for the US. And tell me a little more about your childhood. You know, what kind of family environment did you have? Was it a very um, academic family with an emphasis on education? Obviously, your father was um, was uh, quite a successful businessman. It, it was a family with a lot of a uh, lot of family members who have had advanced degrees, and many uh, of them had degrees from England because at that time, um, England was the main main source of, of uh, universities, good universities. So it was not uncommon in our family for young men to go abroad to study at all. So it was not that difficult for me to convince when I wanted to go abroad. Um, but except that uh, by this time, the, the situation had changed and the United States was becoming more the prominent place to go to study. Um, but but I, I do come from a very well-established an educated family. It's, it's been a privilege. And um, what were your early, earliest academic experiences? What subjects do you remember interesting you and did certain courses really inspire your love of learning? In school, I went to a, a Catholic school and um, it was a very good school. Now I think back about the school is was known as St. Lawrence High School. Um, I liked um, painting, art, writing, um, math. Um, I like biology a lot, I remember. So uh, when I applied for higher education, um, there was an All India competition for, for these few slots in the Indi Indian Institute of Technologies, which is the best university in India. Uh, and I got in. And when I applied, I wanted to do my uh, degree in architecture. That was my first preference. Uh, because I thought that I like art, and that was kind of an overlap with my dad's business on construction. So why not go for something that we can combine in architecture and civil engineering? And so, so I started as an architect. And one of your bios says that you credit contradictory forces in your life yes. for your intellectual journey. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, well, uh, there are a couple of... Uh, things um, that I think uh, I would call dual, dual demands on, on, my, on the way I think. And I'll give you one example about um, architecture and aesthetics, which I still enjoy very much. I, I just like looking at beautiful things, well-designed things, parks, uh, beautiful environments, uh, beautiful clothing, furniture. Uh, and at the same time, Having been raised in a city like Calcutta, I'm very conscious about poverty and about um, deprivation and, uh, and inequalities. And this tension between aesthetics and inequality uh, has, has always um, influenced my thinking. So I, I, I work, worked on architecture, then I moved to city planning to look at cities, how poor people manage to live in cities. But now, if you, <laughs> if you ask me, like you asked me before about JP, my first thought was the Arboretum. So I, I'm still very drawn to beautiful things. 
And that doesn't mean JP doesn't have poor people. JP actually has much larger share of poor people than probably Cambridge. And JP being? Jamaica Plain. Where you live now. Where I live now. So that was one set of tension that I had to deal with. I, I still kind of uh, struggle with it, but I think it makes me uh, a more interesting person because I have this kind of dual need. Uh, I'm also uh, very much an academic and I enjoy academia. I'm married to an academic person. I have family members who are academic. But at the same time, I like getting things done, uh, professional things, you know, so building things. Like architecture, you have to build something to show. Uh, same in planning. You make the city run. And so there is a, there is a difference between just understanding, which is in academia often the dominant mode, and actually getting things done and supervising it, doing it well. And again, so f I, I thought for a moment when I came to MIT, well, if I don't get tenure, which is possible because it's so difficult, I'll just go back to practice. Yet I know when I, if I go to practice, I will miss the, the life of the mind, which is academia, reading wonderful things, being with colleagues who have incredibly new questions to ask. So again, that's a, that's a duality. So I wrote in that piece about this, I think you have two or three examples of that, um, between India and the United States. But the allegiance to my place, to my country where I grew up, um, I still go. I just was there last week. Um, I visit, I do work there. I advise the planning commission. And I'm quite attached to my family who are members who are still uh, alive and to my old university, which just gave me a very nice award, Distinguished Alumni Award, which I went to receive last week. And yet, I'm deeply drawn to the United States. This is the place where I got my best education. I married somebody from here. My child is here. And um, what the level of things I have received in this country, starting from health, good health care to exceptional education, to a lot of emotional support from my wife um, and my daughter, neighbors, the, the setting, um, beautiful places to visit. I, it, it's just part of me now. So you have this kind of dual allegiance, right? So some, I don't have to choose. <laughs> I, I, keep, I enjoy both. <laughs> so it, it's another example of that, yeah. Growing up in India, this awareness of the poverty and the dichotomy between those who had resources and those who didn't, mm -hmm. was that something that your family discussed or was it just something that you ended up coming to realize over time? Was it openly acknowledged? I think uh, West Bengal, where, where the city of Calcutta is located, is a very political state uh, in terms of, uh, of being run by political parties who do make inequality an issue. And it was one of the states that were controlled by the Marxist Communist Party of India for almost 30 years. And that's really one reason why I even left working with my dad, because we had a lot of labor troubles in, the, in managing the business. But the empathy for, for labor, for inequality, um, it was cultivated in me also by the Jesuits. I think in my school, Catholic school, uh, the Jesuit fathers who, who taught us, um, they, they drew attention to it, that we were privileged, that we were in, in the school, in the, in the heart of Calcutta with a vast amount of land, and right outside the school there were very poor people sleeping on the pavements. And same at home, and you'd come home and right outside the main entrance to the, to the building, there are people sleeping on the, on the pavement still Still, we're talking about 2012. And so um, it's not really possible to ignore that inequality uh, if you are observant of anything in social life. And um, I also um, realized that um, that was painful. That, that was painful for me to watch. And I, I, because I like aesthetics and, and beautiful things, I wanted everything to fit into a beautiful setting. <laughs> You know, so uh, later I got more studying of economics because I came to realize that the problem was not one of architectural design or physical design only, that the economy had to produce jobs, 
for the people, for vast number of people. And then if their income goes up, they'll be able to buy. Then the city can respond to them. You know, they need disposable income. And so um, it's still a very central part of my writing and thinking as to how to create policies that would benefit those groups of people. And your undergraduate degree was earned in India, as you talked about. Um, how different do you think that experience was um, versus maybe had you come to the US and come to MIT or an American undergraduate university? How do you compare? Um, it's hard to compare because I didn't go through the undergraduate. But what I know of it now, I think I would have had more flexibility in the US in terms of choice of courses. In India, the, the uh, curriculum is totally set. You, you don't have any choice. Everybody in the class, they have to take the same courses. Um, and I think that um, also in terms of, of uh, advising, uh, 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 specializing, let's say, within architecture, I didn't, I had to come to my own decision what I want to do my, my thesis on. Uh, which was actually on a, st on a large student center that I designed. Uh, but I think if I was here, I probably would have had a number of people um, advising me on different things, like let's say design of museums, or design of, uh, of amphitheaters, or design of, of colleges. It, we didn't have that variety of options. Um, and how did it affect? How it affected in two ways. One was that you had to do what, was, what you were asked to do. Uh, and there is some discipline in that, that you need to do. Sometimes you have to do. Uh, the, the downside of it was that you, could, you couldn't be as creative as you wanted to be, because you, your, sp your special parts of your, of your strength was not sought out. Yeah. So we, I think which in the American universities, are brilliant the way they do, and the flexibility they provide is, is immense. And I'll give you one example that really blew my mind when I first came. It was not a for undergraduate. Uh, it was a course I was taking uh, in, in my master's level, and somebody told me in, in November, it was November, uh, don't, don't panic because if you don't finish well, you can take an incomplete and work over the winter break, and then you'll get a grade. I had no idea that this, something like this is possible. And when I remember talking to this individual saying, so how did you guys start this, providing this incomplete? They said, uh, the point is whether you know the material. If you know the material and you need one more month to finish and complete, but ultimately you know it well, that's the goal. Not to just push you in a corner, you know, which is a very nice approach. I love the American approach to teaching and learning. Yeah. Was there also an advantage to the more disciplined and the more narrowly focused um, approach that your undergraduate school took in India when you then came to the U.S. for your graduate work? There was an advantage in the sense that I, I was trained to work very hard. And it came from the Catholic school and it came from undergraduate work uh, that you had to put in enormous amount of work. I was also quite used to a uh, very stiff competition because there are many, many people in India f competing for a few slots. So that kind of competitive mode that sometimes allows you to go that extra mile, that was, that was cultivated well. But I do think that um, the, the price, you pay price for that. I think that um, Competition is, of course, natural in any setting. Um, but does that bring out f within, from within us our best performance? Maybe sometimes it does, but not always. And did you pursue architecture because you wanted to be an architect? Or was it an area yes. that interests you because of the beauty and the combination of many things that interested you? Both. I mean, I like beauty. As I said, I, I like aesthetics. I think more, more interestingly, aesthetics. Uh, and I wanted to go with that feeling that I had. Uh, and then there was a kind of utilitarian approach towards doing something that is not just painting and art, which is very hard to make a living in India. 
and my father had a construction business, so I thought, if I do architecture, we could do something together, that I could do the design and maybe the other parts of the firm could do the construction. But a beautiful living environment, uh, I think it's, it's exceptionally important for me, and I still um, feel that that's where I do my best work when I'm in a setting of that nature. Would you say MIT is a setting of that nature? Um, in the initially when I came, uh, I was not that taken by MIT because I came from University of California, Los Angeles, which has a very beautiful campus, as you probably know. UCLA campus was a place that you could take a walk, um, you could see in a ca cafe, there will be mountains you could see, beautiful foliage, uh, the buildings were beautiful. It was a beautifully planned campus because the way they got land, uh, they could do that. So when I first came to MIT, um, what struck me was this 77 Mass Avenue sort of bifurcating the campus. Um, it just created a different pace for me to deal with this busy street. And also, I didn't see the river as much as I wanted to see it. I wanted to feel that, that I'm next to a river, beautiful river, right? It was still being cleaned at that time. Uh, I found the hallways of MIT kind of drab. Um, and um, it was not a place for, for aesthetics. It was a place to get work done. So I think the labs um, are the central part of MIT. But I have to say that um, being here for all these years and, and having participated in these conversations about the Stata Center and this new group of buildings that have come up, uh, and our ex-dean who died two years back, uh, Bill Mitchell, was very strongly involved in that. And there was a conversation about, do we need something like Stata Center? Uh, do we need Stuart Hall's building? Um, and I have come to, through that conversation, I have come to realize that in, in MIT's own way, uh, there is an aesthetics. Uh, if you define the term aesthetics differently and not in a kind of classical way, um, the students who come here, the faculty who are here, um, they have a very unique approach to life. And this unique approach is what I think um, Frank Gehry tried to cap capture in that building. Something very strange, you know, that from people outside say, w what is this? And you often say that about MIT student. They are brilliant, but at the same time, you can't exactly put them in a box. And so I thought that isn't that interesting intellectual challenge to capture the psychic of this faculty and student and express it in a different in a built form. And um, so MIT has grown on me. I have to say it's grown on me. I still like the Killian Court, but my best, absolutely my favorite spot where I would go for if I really looking for peace is the chapel. I love this chapel. I think it's an incredible piece of work. And you know, it's very small. Uh, inside it's not that many people can sit, but. I have been there a couple of times because many of my colleagues have died. Because I came in 84 and people who were at that time senior, many of them died. Some died when I was department head. So I had to organize the memorial service, etc., for them. And so I would go to this chapel earlier to make sure everything is in place, right? So there's not that many people. And you see this stream of lights coming down. At, and on this brick wall that's curved, it's a beautiful piece of work. I think so. I was sitting there the other day in the, in the student center looking at it from outside. And if you see the top of it, um, I, I was really asking myself, what was Sarinan thinking? Why did he create this space? Um, it's it's my, absolutely my favorite spot. Um, now the new building, the new um, Media Lab building, uh, which is also beautiful, I think, which Bill Mitchell also also instrumental. You go to the top floor, which is, has the conference rooms now, and there's a big patio that you can walk out and see the river. It's the first time I feel like there's a building at MIT where I can be in the building and absorb the river, river at the same time. It's very beautiful. 
and on a beautiful day, and you see Back Bay on the other side, and it's just gorgeous, gorgeous place. So, yeah. So you found the river, the spot with the river view that you were so seeking. Yeah, I, I think river is very important for a city and for just the sense of water. You know, water has a different quality to it. And, um, and the water, quality of the water, the color of the water changes a lot in this in this city because of the weather uh, and it's 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 volume changes it's it's shade changes it's uh, it, it it reflects in a different way the lights it's very beautiful and uh, i i think that um the cities that are i like generally all have water running through them so i bet there aren't very many people running around the mit campus who notice the color or the texture of the water of the river like you have <laughs> N maybe not that many, but I think there are people who still appreciate, you know. I, I have come to realize that uh, even though there is this, this kind of technology and science and aura of that, uh, when I ask people uh, questions about where, so where do you take a break if you are feeling harassed or something, do you go for a walk? And they would often say like, oh, I, sometimes I take a walk across the across the." road, which is a very busy road, which is sort of a barrier. Um, so people find peace. Uh, you ask doctoral students, for example, who are the most harried, and you know, the doctoral student housing uh, on Memorial Drive. I have asked many, many doctoral students, so what do you love about the place? And they would say, oh, the view from the apartment is just beautiful. And then I ask, like, how many students share the apartment? Oh, we have to share with three or four, and I'm thinking like, oh, wouldn't that be nice to have your own? <laughs> you know, so you can really see it, watch the watch the sun go down, and have a cup of tea or something. So I think there are people are aware of it, but it's not as much celebrated at MIT because um, that's not the culture of the place. Is that sad to you? Um, it's not sad. But I think uh, it, I have seen that that's another approach to life. And I think that um, more and more you see that your approach is not the only approach. So I have mine. I know what I prefer. Uh, but there are many others. And they are, some of them are, are very well articulated, uh, well thought out. And um, they are very smart people. And so MIT has this very nice style of, okay, you can do your work. As long as you do it well, and you do it very, very well, exceptionally well, no one would bother you. I, I have to say this about when I came as assistant professor, and I was, as I said, I was a student at UCLA. I was struck by how little senior faculty tried to tell me what I should be working on. Not one. And in a way, people told me, maybe you are not getting enough advice. You know, you should get some more mentoring. And, you know, this will hurt you later in, when you come up for promotion. Uh, I don't know if it is because I was fortunate. But I felt like uh, totally free uh, to do what I wanted to do. And I did good work. Uh, I was engaged with what I did. And I was lucky to get tenure. But... Um, and that's the same policy I follow when, I, when we hire junior faculty. I don't want to sit over their back and tell them what to do. Yeah. And if that, those are the types of people who need help, they, I, I don't think we, sh we, need, we, don't, we don't want them at MIT. Yeah. And you found that out once you had gotten here. But what was it about MIT that drew you here? Well, the name, of course, MIT, in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is world known. And when I applied to MIT, I also had the option of going back to the World Bank where I had done some work for them. And I was posted in Zambia, you might have seen in my CV. So I had a choice of either going to the World Bank and working on development issues or, and this position opened up as assistant professor. My wife, who always wanted to be an academic and also was a doctoral student at UCLA, where that's where I met her, um, when I asked her, what do you think we should do? She said, go to MIT. And I said, well, uh, why? And she said, well, B, she will be in Cambridge. 
I could probably get a job, teaching job there. There's so many other universities there. Then I called my father, who I respected, and he told me, Aim, if you have an offer from MIT, you don't think of any other things. I mean, this is the ultimate. It's because technology, the idea of technology, you know, is so central to the people who are into development process. And he was a civil engineer. So for engineers, this is it. <laughs> There's nothing better than this. So I thought, okay, uh, I have a choice. And I thought, well, if some people did warn me, because if you, you go into MIT, you know, it's a very high, highly ranked place. You may not get tenure. So I thought, I'll take a chance. And if I don't get, I'll look for elsewhere, or I go back to practice. Um, it worked. <laughs> And how much did that mean to you to get that first teaching position here and kind of launch that next phase of your career? It meant a lot to get into MIT. And I remember when I mentioned it to my advisor at UCLA that after the interview, I had borrowed his coat to come for an interview because it was cold. And, you know, California, you don't need a coat. So I, when I gave him back the coat and I told him that, he said, how did it go, the interview? I said, um, I think I think it went well, but people were not overtly friendly, friendly, or were not overtly critical. I think it went well because you know California, the culture is very different. Um, and then I got a phone call uh, that you got the job, and they told me the salary. And I said, listen, I, I don't, I didn't even need to know the salary. I knew that this is incredible, prestigious position. So I went and told my advisor I got the job, and he was just ecstatic. And I didn't know at that time, which I later found out, that he was at MIT for a while, and he was denied tenure, which I did not know, because he later went to Chile, and then he went and worked for University of Chicago, he, then he was the head of the program at UCLA. So I knew there was some association with MIT, but I didn't know that he was, he really wanted to be here and, and be tenured. So he announced to everybody, my student got into MIT. And for now, till now, when I go to UCLA, and I was there in uh, September, because they had a meeting of, of the brought the alumni, some of the alumni together. It's always so nice when they introduce me that as their alumni from urban planning, who has been the chair of the faculty. I mean, they're so proud of me. And um, so it's, it is, I'm more and more realizing how privileged <laughs> I have been and how fortunate I have been. It, you know, when it happens to you directly, it, it's too quick to even sort of internalize it. But as I come, as I grow more into it, I see my daughter, as other people, other friends. Um, I just have had an exceptionally successful and, and a privileged uh, life. I, I, I don't know who I owe it to, but <laughs> I, I have it. <laughs> what a nice yeah. problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it's a, prob it's a problem only in the sense of do you feel like you're giving back enough? I think it's important. And when I still, when I go to India and I see this level of, of poverty, etc., I'm really struck by how my life would have been different if I was born to one of those families, right? It would be totally different. And so when you have the privilege and, uh, and the opportunity to contribute, uh, you have to. That's part of your moral upbringing. That's what we teach our students. Uh, so are there more ways to give? Um, I think that it's a thought that comes to me, my mind quite a lot because, you know, now, right now, the election's going on, and did you see the statistics on uh, what share of the income each of the presidential candidates actually give it to charity? It was very interesting hmm. for me. And I know that some um, uh, Christian families, my, like my wife's family, with their Methodist, they actually give like 1% a year they decide at the beginning of the year. And so they, they give it every Sunday when they go to the church. And I don't go to a church, uh, but I think that the idea of giving back in many different ways, including monetary, um, it's important. Because I really, my income between two of us is more than sufficient, even with one child. 
So uh, that's one way to give, to feel like, am I giving enough or am I buying more beautiful things because I like beauty? <laughs> that that's goes back to the question I was saying. If I see a beautiful piece of furniture, I, my immediate thought, so it would be so nice to have this writing desk, right? Do you need it? Could, could a kid go to school, school for this writing desk that you are taking to, for yourself? I think those are the questions that are, are very important. And I think that um, I wish MIT as a place, as a university, would have more of those kind of courses. That's one thing I would very much like to see uh, offered. Our philosophy department is very good, but very small. Um, and the students, I find our students, because I teach a course called DLAB with Amy Smith, who, who got the, um, actually the MacArthur Prize Award. And these are, um, I see these are young kids who come and they want to go around the world solving problems for the poor. Uh, small technological devices they, they do, you know. And they are, so I know that that is there. They are also thinking about the poor. Maybe they have come from a different angle, different trajectory, but they are concerned. Uh, and this is something that I'm very proud of MIT. People from outside do not realize uh, how socially conscious these our students are who are very smart technologically. And you know, so you need to get into the conversation. You need to share with them your thoughts. You need to say, this is what I did. This is what are the different options. Uh, and that would what I'd like to see more at MIT, done in a more formal way. Yeah. And when do you feel like that um, sense, that compassionate approach, the human element to looking at the world mm -hmm. started to infiltrate your, your chosen career of architecture and then urban planning? Or was it always there? I think it was there partly um, also in the in this Catholic school. I think this Catholic school, uh, there is a very strong moral undertone to it, you know. And these Jesuit fathers now, you know, even when I go now, I was in Belgium two years back for a very another very nice uh, conference or some uh, some occasion, and I thought, oh, I'll go see these cities where these Jesuit fathers came from, and near Brussels. These are beautiful cities, beautiful places, and then I started thinking. What made these young men leave these beautiful cities to go and stay, stay in Calcutta? When I'm leaving Calcutta, right? They spend their whole life teaching, ed educating people in, in Calcutta. So it made me think, what, why are they making these choices? And I think, th so the school cultivated by sort of examples, you know, and there was a course called Moral Science in, a, in the school from class one to class 11. And then the other part that I think um, cultivated this in me is reading, reading fiction, which I like very much. And I think that's, um, that's a very important source of looking at the world. Um, and I still like f fiction. I read widely. I, I also read journals, many journals. And at a moment like this now, with the, with the way the economy is, where the way income inequality is, um, it's you, you can't you can't start a start a conversation without addressing this issue. So um, I, I, unfortunately, it's going to be more and more important, you know. And and for us people like us who have the advantage uh, of a good income, a good um, life. Um, we need to we need to lead that conversation. Going back to when you started here at MIT as an assistant professor, mm -hmm. what was the transition like to the MIT culture for you, both as someone who came from India see, originally, yeah. then from the West Coast yes, um, in yes. your schooling, um, and but particularly because you were born and initially educated abroad. Yeah. Um, it was hard a bit, but not as hard because partly because I was married to an American woman who helped me in many ways culturally to interpret um, how I'll be seen, how my gestures will be seen. But she's very social like me. And both of us um, like friends. And we had a lot of friends in California, almost too many. And that's why I took time to finish my dissertation. I, I love organizing parties in our house, in small house in California. So when I came, I 
almost every weekend or so we would invite some faculty, even though they were not my age. And they would come, they were surprised because first of all, we are junior people, but we are both, uh, we have both very um, strong sense of, of uh, a social life. We read, we can have a very good conversation. And gradually these people began to uh, come and that was a very big issue later for me. I realized that I was able to break through some of these power relationships because I had taken the initiative to do these social things. They also were very impressed by my wife because who is a scholar and now after being at MIT for 10 years, she just started at Harvard. She just moved to Harvard for starting this January 1st. And she's, she also loves the life of the mind. So people enjoyed our company and we, had, we made some nice food, not huge, but some nice food. And I think MIT, what I realized is that MIT has a lot of people who'd love to do that, but they don't do it. You know, so you might say, okay, let's have a coffee or something, but to say, let's have dinner and we will make the dinner and we'll make something unusual, right? It takes time uh, and that is why I think people often hesitate because the time is so precious, you know, because of the tenuring, et cetera. But I met so many friends and I think the reason I was selected to be the department head after being here for only uh, nine, I, mean, I came in 84, in 1994, when Phil Clay became the chancellor, vice chancellor, they asked me to be the chair. I think it was because I had created a sense of trust among a number of people within the department, just because of social being together, reading their material, arguing with them over dinner, you know? And, um, and it, it's helped me later, even in, in the uh, larger MIT level. Um, that's a big strength I have. You were almost creating a community within a yes. community. Yes, yes, yes. I'm able to do that. That's a, that's a part of the strength I have. And I'm ho fortunately, I'm married to somebody who also loves that. So it works. Otherwise, <laughs> it wouldn't work if I, she was a, an introvert. <laughs> yeah, or she would have been more, um, more, uh, more sort of, you know, if, you're, if you have a set of beliefs that you very strongly, strongly stick to, then it's very hard to be with people who don't believe in that. But I think what is nice about MIT is that you could have a group of people who don't agree with you and they will argue it in a very forceful way and, and that you can't just dismiss. And that's so interesting. That's how you grow. And that's how you subject your own thinking to, to scrutiny. And if you do it over a nice dinner and a nice place, beautifully laid out table, it's the best moment. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the sort of intense, high-pressure environment yeah. that MIT is known for, m mostly for the students, but it also sounds like it bleeds into the faculty life, and you were providing an outlet for that. Why do you think that was such a unique gesture on your part? Why is there a culture here you know, that can't have both, that, that it's often a little more skewed towards the, the work and a little less towards the play? Is it just yeah. the prestige of the place? I think that work the, to do excellent work it takes time. It takes time. There is no doubt about that. And people, are want, they want to put that time first on their work. And the junior faculty are even very worried because of tenuring, right? So they just see that socializing as the last thing. And they want to spend the time. Senior faculty, once they have got used to this junior lifestyle, they think it's very hard to get out of it. You know, so they might socialize with one or two people, but not a lot. Um, look at our faculty club. Uh, MIT doesn't really have a serious faculty club of the kind that Harvard has. And w when I ask people, how come we don't have a faculty club that pe because people would go there for a drink, um, I was told that, listen, most people do not live nearby. And um, they, it's, there is no culture of that kind of hanging out in a faculty club, having a drink, and, and then thinking of something like at Harvard. There is a different culture to the place, but I don't think we want to make it black and white. W what I'm saying is if I was able to create this small community, I am totally sure there are people like me in every department. There are some, some one or two who can play that role. 
and they, they are probably playing that role. And often we don't hear about them that much, you know? Right, yeah. exactly. How do you think MIT today is different from the way you found it when you first got here? How has it changed? Um, well, they are definitely more diverse. I mean, when I came, it was not bad, but uh, inter the international faculty, share of international faculty, students have increased, African Americans have increased, not as much, increased women have increased. And my um, best moment so far uh, was when I chair, when I was not the chair of the search, but I was a member of the committee that brought Susan Hockfield. So this serving in this presidential search committee and getting the first women scientist to accept the job. And I remember we had a small lunch with Susan before she was introduced to the whole MIT crowd in building 10250. And I was walking before her coming back from the lunch. So I come in and I thought, I looked at the where, you know, where you usually go and sit and I couldn't find a place. So I had to come through the, through the stage. So I come in through the stage and I look up and like jam pack 10 to 50 waiting for Susan. And so, I, you know, I'm looking and the Chuck Vest was sitting in the front seat. I found a seat next to Chuck. So I sit next to Chuck and then walks in Susan Hockfield. The, the level of, th of applause was just moving. It was, I knew that I had participated in a historical moment that this is a historical moment that an uh, institution like MIT has a women scientist who is the president. You wouldn't believe the feeling, I still cannot explain the feeling of that moment that, oh, so this, I was part of this moment. And it has, so it has, it has been a, one of the high point in my life that to be able to participate in that way. Uh, I think MIT is, um, MIT's financially, MIT's situation has changed. I think that the, the kind of way we fund finance ourselves, uh, I had no idea uh, when I came that, uh, that it fluctuated so much because we are not that dependent before on endowments. But now this current crisis, and because I was also chair of the faculty, I could see the crisis from within, what was happening to the investment portfolio. Uh, I was surprised. Uh, though we are still one of the universities with the, one of the largest endowment, right? We are probably seventh in the nation. But still, if you look at where the money is coming from, so there's research, there's endowment. Research money from government, research money was still okay, but it had gone down after the end of the Cold War, which was late 80s, right? So Soviet Union fizzled out. So the kind of way we funded ourselves had to be rethought. Uh, endowment become big. And so that, that financial structure, I think, has shaped partly how we operate uh, as, as a university. Um, the, and the last crisis, when we, we had to basically freeze faculty salary, et cetera, um, made me realize that the institution was still somewhat vulnerable. And, uh, you know, to, to the external economy. And since this external economy is still not in full steam, um, that's a worry I have about how, how will it work. And particularly, I think, how will it work means how will we, cr to, how will we ensure access of large number of undergraduate students who are not from wealthy families. The statistics that I am so proud of of MIT. This is something that I tell people when I mention MIT. Almost 18% of the first incoming class last year were f from families where the, they were the first one to go to college. And compare that with me. In my family, th third generation back, we had people going to England to study. And these kids are here, but they didn't have the privilege, but we opened the door and they're brilliant kids, right? What a wonderful thing to do. That is what I want MIT to be able to preserve. That's wonderful, opening the doors even yes. wider to this amazing place. Um, did you have uh, many mentors early on in your uh, early years here at MIT? 
You know, I was thinking because I, I, I thought about this question because it was not a mentor in a formal way, but, I, but there was a, gen, a, a professor here, Professor Lloyd Rodwin, who was very respected, and he was the one who had instrumental, I think, in bringing me, though he and my advisor, my advisor who was my dissertation advisor at UCLA, were arch enemies. And Professor Rodwin was instrumental in denying, later I found on, in denying tenure to my advisor. But when I came, applied for the job, he was polite, and he really wanted somebody who come from a different sort of a school of thought. And my advisor had created a very different school of thought in development planning, very different from what Lloyd stood for. So when I came in, I was very taken because Lloyd was very nice to me. But he was, he g gave me all the opportunity. He told me the courses I could teach, but he was not uh, willing to listen to a not well well developed argument, he was very strict. When even an argument sake, he would defend his position very well, and I could defend my position well. And so, I didn't need the kind of advising that sometimes we say to junior faculty, like you know, what you have to publish, where are you publishing, and how many p papers should publish. It it just didn't happen in my case. People are very happy with me from the beginning. I wrote, I wrote a major piece of work that I think got me the tenure. And the mentors were people who, um, who were mentors by, by their work. I just saw how they published, how they wrote, how respected they were in the profession, how rigorous they were. Um, it, and then well, they were mostly men. But one woman, I have to say, she came with me in 1984, but she came from Berkeley. And she had never taught at Berkeley, but she was much senior to me, uh, had just gone through a divorce, uh, and she was looking for a job. MIT offered her a visiting faculty position because she had done enormous amount of work for development agencies. Um, her name is Judith Tendler. She just retired last year. And because she came in 84, I came at the same time. I was assistant professor. And she, of course, she didn't have any family. And my wife and she got along quite well. I now, looking back, I realized that in terms of intellectual impact of shaping my thinking, I think this woman had immense impact. And uh, that is why I went to a great length last year to, to play a big role in or arranging for her for her um, retirement party, which was incredible, but she, you know, the, um, what I think is interesting is it, when you look at institutions, you know, there are some people who consider themselves marginal, and often people who are not mainstream or you're not white or male, you you have to find your place. Now, of course, I, I was a, a, from international faculty, and I never felt marginalized. To be honest, to, to honest with you. But nevertheless, there are conversations that happen that are kind of unusual conversations on the fringe. And I think women, particularly this woman and others, um, often create small conversations. And those are on the fringe of institutions, but they're often very interesting. And I was fortunate because of her to bring a critical perspective on the mainstream issues which my other advisors were working on. But the other advisors were never turned off by this. They were actually quite uh, excited. They, they, they wanted some fresh voice. So I had the benefit of both. I had the support of these people whose support mattered in terms of political power. And I had the intellectual support of this woman who really gave me a new way of looking into problems. Uh, and she's still there around. Uh, and I think that, uh, so it was a very good combination. Pretty invaluable to have Pretty, people yeah. in your career. Unusual, very unusual. Now, yeah. are you in the role of mentor today? How, how do you approach that? Do people come to you yeah. now? Uh, they do, and you know, when I was department head, of course, I was in a formal role of a mentor, and I, we hired a lot of people, junior, fa junior faculty. And, um, I always remembered what had happened to me. I, I never forced myself as a mentor, but my door was open. I told them, um, tell me what you need. 
I started creating some new policies like giving a fully paid semester off before people come up for tenure because I realized time is what they need. We gave good salaries. I gave uh, starting startup salaries to, to junior faculty so they didn't have to immediately go and apply for grants, um, lower teaching load, etc. cetera. Um, and then they did their own work. And it was, they were not all hired in my field because we have a very big department. So to, for me to go and some advise somebody, let's say, who is working on environmental issues, which I'm, I don't work on, though, of course, it's a, an aspect to think about. Uh, it's not appropriate because there's other people who know more. So I didn't formally advise people, um, but one thought I'll share with you. I think that when you have to tell a junior person that they, are, they have been wonderful, but they are not going to be up for tenure or that didn't work, it's the most painful thing for me. It was, it, as a department head, that was the worst thing that I had to go through when I had to sit with somebody young and give them this news without um, breaking their confidence, which obviously they, it's, it's devastating when you tell this to somebody, you know, that it didn't work, we, you know, it's not your fault, you know. What do you say exactly? That you are not good enough for us. And I just think that it's the less we have to do that, the better. And the best way is to be very strict about who, you, who we bring in. We should bring in the very best. Then, then the process is easier later, you know. But if you just bring in thinking, well, they'll come and then after seven years they'll leave, like what happens at Harvard. Harvard, the rate of tenure is very low. But the process, the emotional cost that a young man or a woman have to go through is, is a huge damage that they will spend their whole life reconstructing. And I think that's, that's I think, needs to be thought through more, how to do it. How to avoid it. How to avoid it and what arrangements do you need. You, it will invariably happen in a top place. But there are good ways of doing it and there are terrible ways of doing it. And I think that's, for a mentoring, within mentoring, I would say that's one key element that I would like to think more about. You have multidisciplinary interests. Clearly, you have a degree in architecture, but this strong interest in social sciences, which mm -hmm. then led you to get the doctoral studies, uh, to doctoral studies in international development mm -hmm. planning. Does any one of these disciplines re uh, resonate with you any more than the other? Obviously, you have the architectural foundation yeah. for all of it. I think it varies in, 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 in terms of your intellectual trajectory. When you solve a problem or you have addressed a problem for a while, um, then other things may come up. For example, um, I've been working on India and the cities in India. And, you know, I've been very worried about this, how to house this large number of poor people who are sleeping on the streets, etc. Housing, housing for the poor, I've been worrying about a lot. And lately, when I was there, I realized that um, in some of the cities, the parks, um, the parks were overused because these poor people have nowhere to go. They don't even have house. So the parks, they're sleeping and they're, you know, they're not taken care of. And I started thinking, oh, oh my, I wish I, I think I would give a little more thought to how to do, design some beautiful parks. Of course, I use a beautiful park myself, which is the Arboretum, Arnold Arboretum. But it will again bring me back to aesthetics. So it's a constant fluctuation between worrying about this income, poverty, how to do this, and worrying about other things in life that are not, can be tied down to money but are just aesthetically beautiful, beautiful park. I really think for a poor person that there was a time in my field when there was a discussion about um, whether we should be spending money on these things when people don't have water, don't have electricity, why are we worrying about aesthetics, etc. I have come to the point thinking now that aesthetics matter a lot. It actually matters more for people who don't have anything else. 
because of the psychological impact yes. on them? Yes, give them a sense of meaning that they can take the kids there. They need some space that they can feel attached to and some beautiful space that is not overtly expensive, right? So they are not going to go to the opera, they are not going to go, but they might take a little lunch, Sunday lunch box. Wouldn't it be nice if they could have this sit below a tree in a park and they have a lunch? So why shouldn't I design that? <laughs> I want to go back to, you talked a little bit, in general you talked about things you saw in India that, that developed this great concern um, for, for poverty issues. But you had some really eye-opening experiences when you worked for your father at, yes, the, um, yes. at the engineering yeah. firm. Tell me a little more about that and how that experience so influenced your thinking and your ultimate career path. Well, the main thing was because he had asked me to supervise the construction of this bridge. And, you know, I came out of architecture. I didn't know how to design a bridge. But he told me, well, I'm doing the design, but you can do the, do the part of the construction. You can supervise. And why I agreed was because this bridge had a site, separate site, and he told me I could live on that site, in, in, not in a very fancy place, but I, so I didn't have to stay home which I liked very much. At, at that stage, I didn't want to come and stay home because I had stayed in a dorm for my uh, undergraduate and I had gone used to my own lifestyle. Um, so anyway, I go there and every day, at the end of the day, I had to give, um, pay the daily wage laborers, which I had no idea that people are paid on a daily basis, but I had to do it. And at the end of the day, I often saw women or children sometimes would stand by near the door, you know, waiting to be paid. And it's so, I, I didn't even think in the beginning. I thought, well, that's the way it is. And then some days there'll be rain and they had not worked. So you couldn't pay them. And so these women would come and ask me, uh, saying, um, can, you, can I borrow for, because I didn't get paid today, I have to buy food for tonight. So I realized that they're extremely vulnerable people, you know. And so, um, anyway, so later on the construction site, we are build, doing the construction, like um, laying out the cement, and you would see people without shoes walking on this mold, this cement, and kids running around, women carrying bricks without any protection on their head, no gloves. And it gradually, I came to see that the level of their vulnerability. And it, 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 it was sad. And I, I, it, I made me question that the kind of sense I had about aesthetics. I thought, maybe I just, I'm in a totally wrong path. Maybe this, what I care about is means nothing this aesthetics and this what I've learned. Uh, maybe this, their, their income is to be the main thing. And so I was pretty, I was pretty much concerned about it. But lo and behold, the, the government that time, the Communist Party was in power, came to the state, and they had organized labor, you know, their, their own organization. So of all places, our house in Calcutta that they, they, de they developed a term called ghera, which means the laborers would surround your house and would not let you go out. Till you either increase the wage, you give something. For all of summer. My father was a, generally a progressive man, but he, you, in a business circle, you do not go out and change laws by yourself because you are with a group of other people. They'll say, come on, what are you doing? Uh, they'll be making the same demands. So when that happened, and I, I felt restricted at home, and my father at that time, he told me, listen, instead of wasting the time because you cannot do the work, why don't you go and get a degree abroad? And so I'm, I said, okay, I think that's not a bad idea. So I had to do my portfolio. But my portfolio, when I look back now, was design of series of parks. <laughs> it had nothing to do with poverty. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, here I was struggling with the idea, but my portfolio was a series of parks. Now, this is the difference with American education. If I was educated in an American university, my advisor would have known enough about me to say, Bish, you care about that. Why don't you bring that in in your portfolio, right? Be real. Be, be who you are. And I think that to, 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 to tease that out of you, what is inside you, and to make it into something beautiful, that is a job of an advisor. And that's what academic 
life should be. That's what I hope I can play with my students. So to really know them well, what is it that they care about, that if they are trained well, that same concern, they can express it in a, in a very wonderful way. Once you had focused your efforts on urban development and planning, were there some seminal moments when you knew that you had chosen the right path, where sort of the light bulb went off that you had, you had uh, found your calling, if you will? I think there was a moment when I was in, in UCLA when I found out that the field of urban planning in the U.S. Uh, was very broadly defined. In urban planning, when I came from India, uh, I thought that urban planning would be more physical planning, like master plans of cities, etc., which used to be that way in the U.S. But the 1960s in the U.S., there was a huge turmoil about cities and urban renewal, revolt against urban renewal. There was a model cities program, you know, under President Johnson, the civil rights movement. So city planning had completely changed. And it had become much more, more multidimensional, interdisciplinary. So you could take courses in psychology, you could take courses in sociology, political science. And this, I immensely enjoyed, immensely enjoyed. I had, I really thought when I had that option of taking those kind of courses, um, I thought this is, this is the kind of an education I always wanted. Now, the only problem is that you have limited time to do a degree. And if we start doing many, many things, it's sometimes, uh, it's hard to get into the depth of things, uh, which I now uh, sort of try to take into account as we do our own program design. We are one of the most known planning schools, the number one planning school in the nation for the last 10 years, because we have many diverse courses. But uh, I think rigor, which is also what MIT stands for, a seriousness of explanations. That requires, requires a reading of one thing very well. And so that balance between making something very diverse and interesting and making something very deep um, is an issue that, uh, that we grapple with uh, as academics. And how did you how difficult or easy was it to incorporate this interest that you had in poverty and in lower income segments mm. within a city into urban planning generally? Was that an innovative idea? Uh, it was already beginning to happen. And, and American universities like University of California, Los Angeles, uh, their program was based on the notion that planning of the old kind, which was master plan, and was not really working. Uh, and that came because of historical reasons, because of American, African Americans, the problems of them, the, the construction of suburbs. So some schools were more ahead of others in bringing that. And UCLA was a school created in 1969 by my advisor was brought in to create a kind of a alternative school of thought. And this alternative school of thought um, was very interesting for me because it put every conventional ideas on the table for for um, scrutiny. So one, let me give you one example. The idea of modernization, which is the central idea in planning, right? You modernize uh, the city, you modernize the economy, you modernize your social culture. Uh, people took it for granted. The question is, what is it? What, what is it for? And within modernization, there is a very strong component for technology. Because modernization and technological change are supposed to go hand in hand in the old theory. So when I came to MIT, I had already scrutinized the role of technology. And in a way, I was skeptical of technology and the way technology was being sold as a, you know, it, this is going to solve your problem. And then I realized after I came here that many people here were asking the same questions. It's not that just because it's MIT that, that nobody is questioning the role of technology. There was a science, technology, and society program. There, there's a media lab program. There, there was our own program within our school of planning. There was a woman, Lisa Petey. So I found it very vibrant and people um, understanding technology but saying, well, we, that's not the only solution. We have to do other things. And um, that, uh, I, I was thinking that's, a, that's been a central issue 
uh, in my intellectual growth as to redefine the role of technology in addressing issues of poverty, let's say, right? So in standard planning argument, you would say technology for the very big projects and you have the, for the poor, small, little things. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be that separation. And how um, well equipped is MIT to help you and your colleagues bring urban planning to that next level? Why is this oh, the place well to equipped. do that? Very, very well equipped. Very, very, very well equipped. And I was very, very surprised. Not surprised, I have to say, but, but I found out here that there are a large number of people, and not just in urban planning, uh, like engineering, which I co-teach a course with Amy Smith on D-Lab, Development Lab, where 55 um, students each semester, when they take the course, then they go to, the, to all these countries. All are working on poverty issues during IAP. They're coming back now in a week, and we're going to meet with them as to what they have developed. Small gadgets to help the poor in their households. There are multiple parts of MIT that has been an issue. The Poverty Action Lab, uh, in economics, that deals with that. Um, in humanities, social sciences, there are courses on that. So there's a lot going on. I think that um, the only thing I'll say is that um, we are looking for somehow to give it a shape, to give it a more of a format, a set of courses, a sequence of courses. Uh, and that um, MIT, ha you know, have been involved with it. The I House, the International House, which I also now serve on the board, which is which is learning and living, where 25 students stay there, they go abroad. Uh, many things are happening at MIT, but in the MIT tradition, it hasn't been put into a into a one format. So the good part of it is that it's kind of decentralized, and many things are happening. I think the bad part of it, that, that the downside of it is that um, students still have to find it out themselves, where to look for it. You had a lot of uh, important life changes going on in the early 90s here where you had a new post um, yes, as yes. head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning yes. and then big news happening in your family yes. on a personal level. What, tell me more what was going on then and how do you think you handled it all looking back on it now? It was a big, big change, and I don't know how I did it, to, to be honest with you. My wife, uh, her first 10-year track appointment was at the New School for Social Research in New York in 88, 89. And um, she's an urban sociologist, but she also works on, on planning, developing countries, issues. But her major interest is Mexico because she speaks Spanish, though she grew up here in, in, in uh, St. Louis. Um, anyway, so she, when she got the job, she said, um, look, I, I mean, should I take the job? I'll be in New York. And I thought that she should take the tenure job because it was hard to find a tenure track job here. And, you know, my life is in MIT was full. Uh, of course, we, uh, we missed each other, but she would come back on Fridays. And New York and Boston is not that far off, I mean, if you fly. But 94, um, and I, w I was actually enjoying my sabbatical, my first sabbatical. I had just got my tenure, and I took my sabbatical in Hawaii, in Honolulu, of all places. There's a very good center uh, in there on development studies. And we had been married for 10 years already, and we didn't have a child by choice because it was not possible at that time. Anyway, the one thing to other, the sab sabbatical, my wife gets pregnant. And so she said, what should we do? And she, she, we said, well, we have the baby. Of course we'll have the baby. And how are you going to manage this? So I thought, well, th my, my mother-in-law lives in St. Louis. She could come and maybe help. We said, whatever it takes, we'll face it. But this is, we, we, it's not that we wanted a child. Now that we have this, this is something important for us. So when she came back, and. I just planning to come back, and I get a phone call from the department. Uh, Phil Clay has just become vice chancellor or associate provost, and we would like you to be the department head. And I thought, oh my God, how are we going to do this, right? But I thought, okay, department head, what are we going to get out of it? So I met with the dean. The dean told me, B, she will get three months of summer salary, and what else do you need, tell me, to get do the job? 
So I told them, well, I need some help with child support. I mean, cannot do, you know, there are a couple of things. He really liked me. And he's, by the time I came up to my office after telling him all these things, he sent me a note, I'll take care of it, do it. So I said, fine. Finance was a big issue because we knew that we would be needing more money and this was going to ensure us more money, right? That was a very central part. So um, Diane was, it was difficult for her. Uh, she had to manage this pregnancy and still teaching in the new school. And you know, she was very worried that once you get pregnant for women faculty, you are not taken seriously. And new school is a very top ranking school in social science. Um, Alexandra was born, my colleagues were very helpful. I think what, why I was able to do it was, I really think that uh, my job as a department head was not that difficult a job, partly because I dealt with colleagues who are very civil. Uh, there were very few moments I felt like uh, this job was too demanding. It actually was a very nice job, and, and I was nice to people, and they were nice to me. And it was expensive in terms of we had to get a child care, and there was an uh, Italian architect, a man, who came to town through one of our friends and who said who was going to stay with us and take care of everything, including the food. And this guy stayed with us, Diane commuted, and she stayed with us for I think four years to, to, to take care of her daughter and, and this guy had very good taste. He, he gave my daughter I think his, his her sense of taste and it, it worked and Diane got tenure which, which was very hard but she did get tenure at the new school and then um, I had done that for like almost uh, eight years. I was getting exhausted and then the dean Told me, Bish, you know, your wife is ten years. She's very. She he he liked her. Her work overlaps. Um, let me see if we can bring her here. All my colleagues supported it. And she was, and she came as with a tenured associate professor to MIT in 2002. And then I st I stepped down because it's not it's you can't supervise. And so I I was also I know eight eight years I had done that. So I stepped down. And then I had a very wonderful sabbatical, and Diane was here for 10 years, and now, look at this, now she's moving to, to Harvard. So our daughter is going to go to college. Um, what, what I have to go, what can I complain? <laughs> it's been, the institution had been ve has been very nice to me. I, I got an endowed chair. I have a huge research account. I got the McVicar Fellowship f for teaching. I have a teaching load that I can decide. I have wonderful students. I have secretarial assistants. I have a beautiful office here to come and see my office. It's part of my aesthetics. Um, I, I think, it, I've been, again, I have to say, I've just been very fortunate. I was going to ask you if there was anything about that period that you would have done differently, but it sounds like it turned out quite well in hindsight. I think it worked out well. I, the only thing I'll say is that when you take on administrative task of that nature and you have these family obligations because what the child was based here and Diane would leave Alexandra and then go to, to New York for three, four days, you do not have time for research. And I think in a serious academic institutions, if you stop research, doing research, I think it takes time to come back to research. It's not a machine. And I think that I would have thought through my research agenda maybe a little more carefully because it did take me almost two years when I finished Step Down to get back to writing, which is, a, you know, and I, I couldn't write a lot during the time when I was head. So that, so that, that, that affects your productivity, or, or more than productivity, your seriousness of engagement with an issue. You know, you have to read, you have to read, you have to write, and uh, it's not, there's only, you have only limited time. So, yeah. And how much do you think MIT allows for that balance? It sounds like it's quite a challenge between the work and the family here. 
Yes, but MIT is moving in the direction because partly also because MIT has more women faculty now. And I know that the last provost, um, Bob Brown started this thing of getting senior faculty and he created this policy actually out of which Diane benefited that if a department would bring women, senior women faculty, then um, the department didn't have to pay the, for the full fare. The institute was paying part of it. Uh, and as more and more women faculty came in, then they started the family policy of, you know, where you could take, take uh, paid leave before you have a child. Now MIT is offering a, a, a policy where you can take care of, of senior family members. Uh, and I think the institution is aware of this, um, that there are demands on the faculty's lives. We could do more, but we are moving in the right direction. As, and that is why we have uh, more women faculty. You know, and because they had, imagine that the pressure, if I felt pressure, what level of pressure Diane must have felt. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, totally switching gears. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the special program for urban and regional yes. studies. Tell me about that program and how you think it embodies MI's, MIT's approach to solving big problems. It's a very interesting program and it was created in 1967 by my mentor, if you can call mentor, Lloyd Rodwin at a time when MIT wanted to create a program to bring mid-career professionals from around the world to spend a year at MIT without any strings attached. And Ford Foundation funded it for the first five years. They used to bring around 15 mid-career professionals from around the world to come to MIT. Only one luncheon on a Monday on something or issues of development. That's it, rest of the time you do what you want to do. If you want to attend classes, you want to write, you do. And uh, this program, and I, I managed the program after Lloyd stepped down. Uh, I like the program. You know why? Because it brings practitioners to MIT. And I think the idea of somebody grappling with a problem um, and l using the time to think about the problem um, and we being able to tap into that process I think it's the kind of learning that MIT really likes because MIT is actually about problem solving. So problem solving, you can start with theory, which is classical mode, or you can tell me, let me see if you're struggling with the problem, what are you facing? And, and these are people who are, don't have advanced degrees, but they have grappled with the problem. Like let's say they say, I try to provide housing to the poor in the city X, or I try to create transportation network, or I try to do water. And I and ask him, so what happened? Were you able to do it? And they might say, well, I, maybe I did this well, but I didn't do this well. So this, this basis of knowledge that they bring in, I think it's a very precious for us to have this, and now I have it also funded by the Hubert Humphrey Foundation, which is actually named after Hubert Humphrey and is under the Fulbright. It's Fulbright not for scholars, but Fulbright for practitioners. These are wonderful people. I met with them last night after the, you know, because this semester ended. Uh, all kinds of interesting things they're doing. And um, I think the challenge is how do we take that kind of knowledge and then theorize about it. So it's theorizing from practice, you know, and this is my challenge I'm working with. A second challenge that I think I take it seriously now is because it's paid for by Hubert Humphrey Foundation, which is American taxpayers, it's given from Congress. And these are people coming from abroad. Uh, after September 11th, uh, there was a lot of concern about what is the image of the United States? What do we want these people to know about the US? They're here for a year. Uh, I think it's a very important um, challenge because the nation is in a very important uh, stage, right? And so the, we, are, we are engaged in wars, etc. So I see this task of saying, come to MIT, and not only that you will have all these uh, courses, etc., as you can take, it will have one year for me to give you a glance of this country. Imagine this country that I'm still trying to understand myself, right? And for me to say, okay, I will help you understand, I find that a very intellectually exciting thing. What is it that I want them to know about the US before they leave? 
and they are here for two semesters. So I've been trying all sorts of things. I run a seminar in a seminar called Myths About America. For example, when I asked them, they, I said, what do you know about the United States from outside? They would tell me things like, oh, people here are so individualistic. They don't care about families. The second one that really blew my mind was they're saying people are not religious. I mean, they're Americans are really, I mean, look at this election. So they have these ideas about the United States. Uh, oh, you don't care about social things that much. It's everybody's into making money, right? So yes, but there are other things happening also. And so I see this as an incredible challenge of creating a one-year program, which they can do their own work, so that whatever problem they're working on, and at the same time that they will return to their country with a nuanced view of the United States. And that's why I, I'm still doing it. When those people have returned to their countries, can you relay any anecdotes about you know, hearing how they're doing after their training here so that you said we're making a real impact with this program? I think that they do, and I have a lot because it's been almost 50 years, 67 the program started. So they're in all sorts of high level positions, minister level positions, but the return which is the issue that uh, we are looking at in the last issue of the journal for the, that comes out every year. You know what, I didn't realize that the return is very hard for them. Because they leave for a year uh, and much is expected of them when they come back because they have gone to MIT. Um, socially, after being here, their family relationships change because they are here and they don't have servants, etc. They have to do their home household work. Many cases, the husband and wife, that when they, if they come, um, they have told me that their relationships have changed as a result of the one year. Uh, children, uh, if they bring them, uh, their, the, the schoolings are very good here and they, they, they get used to this very flexible American approach to education and then they have to go back to these old schools which are very rigid. So the re-entry, which is, I'm thinking about how to make the re-entry um, less painful. But in terms of the impact, they are doing very, very interesting work. I mean, all, I, I mean, all five continents. We didn't get as many people from Africa. And that's one thing I'm trying to do because that's really where the help is needed. And MIT, we could use more of a, of a conversation in Africa. That's really, within the development field, that's lagging. We don't have African Studies Center. We have a lot going on in China, a lot going on in India, uh, but we need more in Africa. And that place has a special meaning in your heart, right? Because yes. you spent time there. I spent that. That's where I really got my, my learning of, of uh, education, you know, basically on urban planning because I was based in Zambia. And it was a very interesting time because it was before South Africa even became independent. So I, I think that uh, Africa is where we, they really need help. And, and I hope that we could think of doing something interesting for, for Africa. But uh, my program definitely will. What yeah. did you learn during your time as head of the MIT faculty? <laughs> that could be alone be a material for a whole, whole interview. Um, I learned representing MIT faculty is a huge task because the faculty are exceptional, exceptional. And uh, it's an honor, it's an honor. And I, I still know when I go to places and people introduce me as he was the chair of the MIT faculty, I mean, you should see what that does to this audience. And chair of the MIT faculty, I mean, MIT faculty is like incredible collection of people. Um, what does it do to you when they introduce you like that and remind you that you've had that amazing role. It's, I, I'm constantly reminded of the honor of being there. I, you know what is interesting for me is that the chair of the faculty's role uh, is partly shaped by who is running the administration. Because the chair of the faculty actually do not have that much power. I mean, you go to the academic council, you represent, you are the only one who representing the faculty. In most cases, you have a faculty senate. So you are the interface between the faculty and the administration. So if the administration is generous about faculty, uh, are connected to the faculty, which most cases they are, because 
in MIT administration used to be from the faculty who'd come up, right? And still, fortunately, it is to some extent, though many universities are bringing administrators who are not connected to the uh, university. But I still found that time I was, um, was a difficult period because MIT was just hit the financial problem 2008 and I began 2007. There were a lot of, um, of uh, anxieties on both sides. Um, the Star Simpson case had happened. Susan and the new administration was trying to create a new set of uh, guidelines for administering MIT. It was not Chuck Vest's time. Chuck Vest came out of a very different tradition. So Susan was the first woman president from outside MIT. Uh, Chuck was from outside MIT too. But she was trying her best so that the, the, she created a, a legal framework. And I think when you try to create these new things, uh, faculty are often um, are skeptical because they are used to a place uh, and they just think that, that that has worked before, so why do we need these new things? And I was in the interface of that. I had to deal on both sides. So it was not easy. It was actually, after being a department head, I thought it would be nothing. It would be like a cake, piece of cake. It wasn't. It was a very political position uh, I, because I wanted to protect the faculty. It was my job. And at the same time, uh, I had to work with the administration, which did not see the faculty always as being uh, friendly. And, and, they, and they weren't. It was not just one department. It was the whole institute. So f f faculty in physics, faculty in math, etc. I did not know. I had not had dinner with them. Uh, you know, I had friends in the, my department. So we were trying to change the undergraduate education. We had created a, a, a committee. And that was my first uh, wake up call when I realized after 10 years of work on this committee, with all these senior faculty members supporting it, it still didn't pass in the faculty meeting. And MIT faculty meeting, you have to approve everything before it gets institutionalized. So when that happened, it really made me think, what is it about the process that had to be done differently to create this kind of large base of support? And then the financial crisis comes. So the provost said, well, I'm going to create a set of committees to advise me. And you know, the thing is the faculty do not want to see you being used. So I think what I learned is if you are the chair of the faculty, you should not think of a future position in the administration. Because if you are looking for a job in the administration, you really do not keep in your mind the best interest of the faculty. And the faculty will sooner or later will see through that, that you are just making up your career. And I didn't, I'm glad, and um, I think that um, I had the privilege of knowing a lot of faculty who are Nobel Prize winners, meeting the Dalai Lama, meeting many, many people, top people through the administration. And um, more and more, the world, head of the World Bank, the president of the World Bank, each one was some controversy, unfortunately. It was not easy, including the Dalai Lama's visit, which many faculty opposed, some faculty wanted. The head of the World Bank, many faculty liked, some didn't like. So I was in the middle. But um, when I met with them, and I saw the, the way they think of this institution, it was stunning for me, the respect this institution has globally. And to what extent this respect is what we enjoy when we travel abroad. It is simply mind-blogging for me how this, rep how this institution has created this incredible sense of reputation. And what people associate with you when you say, this is a faculty member from MIT. And I just hope we can preserve this. Um, I don't know if we need to enhance it because it's already in, in but it has, its, it has a, a sense of quality to it. And the work that we do should be up to that level.
of the reputation. It has to have that level of reputation and rigor uh, in, in, and kind of um, creativity um, that, that, that takes a long time to produce. But truly, I'm truly humbled by this reputation of this place. And even, you know, I just came back from India. I mean, you should have seen when they introduced me in, in my in university that IIT, it's called IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. They had a seminar in the afternoon after they gave me the award. And the first seminar, the first question is, what will it take for IIT to become MIT? And I'm sitting there thinking, my goodness, what will it take for you for IIT to become MIT. So there was a student in my panel also. The, he is the head, of the head of the student group. He told me, first of all, let them give us better dorms. <laughs> we don't want to share the dorm with four people. Then how many students are sharing dorms in the MIT? And so, Might you know, take a little more than that, but good start. <laughs> good, at least you have to start somewhere, right? But again, really, don't you think the, the, the reputation of this place, I mean, how did it happen? And I think it happened more after Second World War. And let me say a few, little bit because I thought of that when you asked me of the interview. The Second World War was a major turning point. MIT prior to Second World War was known, but it was not this reputation. And after Second World War with the Cold War, etc. I mean, we played a huge role in technological change and technological development. But after the Second World War was only when School of Humanities was created. Not architecture, architecture was before. But School of Humanities and Social Sciences were created because um, there were a lot of people who were horrified by what technology did in the war, particularly Germany. Yeah? And so understanding technology and its social embeddedness and its political meaning um, are very important intellectual questions. And I think uh, our students um, who are now at MIT and who, are, who will be graduating, if we can give them that understanding, sort of the social basis of technology, and not just the technology itself, but how, how why it flourishes, what kind of institutions you need, what are its impact on people, I think that is our challenge to develop curriculum, to develop practice, to develop an awareness of research. Um, and the 150th celebration that we had um, was an interesting way to reflect back on that and, and to see what we learned. Because, you know, we, are, we were created during a civil war. I mean, what a major historical moment for an institution to be created. And I think now we have come all the way out. And I think that um, if we maintain the rigorousness of work, we have resources, I think. Um, we, we need to hire the absolutely the very best. And we need to bring the best students. Uh, the concern I have is access, financial access, because of the economy that's happening. And from middle class families, these brilliant kids that we used to get, these first timers in their family to go to college, they cannot pay this level of tuition. They simply cannot pay. The president is now aware of it. It's becoming a presidential issue in the campaign. So we need, we need funds to say, don't worry about the money. You have shown by your work that you are brilliant in this work. We want you to come. We want you to, to educate you by knowing about this technology in its social and its political impact. Uh, we, don't we want you to do research in one of the best labs. We want you to associate with one of the best faculty in the world. And I hope, I really hope that everyone that would watch this interview would have the time I have at MIT. It's been an absolute the best thing in my life. Without any hesitation, I can say that. That's wonderful. I was going to ask you how MIT played into your intellectual journey. I don't think I need to ask you because you just answered it. Yes. And 
and your legacy here, I mean, you went, you mentioned the chapel earlier, your favorite building on campus, and how you attended several funerals and memorial services for colleagues who passed away. Being at those services, how did that make you reflect on the legacy, the sense of legacy here, and maybe, you know, what, what mark you want to leave on this institution, ultimately? Um, the people whose memorial services I was able to um, participate, in some cases I, I organized, were giants, intellectual giants in the field. And when I had to reread their work, because I had to talk about it um, in, the, in the service, and, and also sometimes we would have journals devoted to their work, each one of them broke new ground in their field. And it's a huge task. To, to break new grounds. Um, the kind of knowledge you need of a field to break new grounds and the playfulness you need to say that doesn't have to be the edge. Um, it's how they came to it, uh, I have often thought. And my journey has been different. I was not educated here in undergraduate. Um, I went through a very different trajectory. Um, and I have, uh, and uh, it makes me think as to why, what could I do to contribute? I, and I think I do have, in my own ways, um, tried to sort of question the broad field of development planning, the broad field of what does it mean to compare countries in, in terms of education, etc. Um, but ultimately, I think hard work, just staying at it, working with it, uh, working with a good group of students who are going to be able to question, because the breaking of new grounds often come from students, because they're so fresh and they're so smart, and they always ask, would ask you a question, and then you start thinking, that's interesting, right? So I think that the students, um, students are a huge resource huge resource for us, for people who are trying to think of a new field. But the institution also provides us the financial resource, the, you know, the, the infrastructure, a good group of colleagues who would read your material or would come to a talk and would question you. That um, excitement um, to create that level of vibrancy, intellectual vibrancy, uh, I think with, this, with the resources we have, uh, is the challenge, is a, is a challenge. And I know because I had been an administrator and I'm now teaching that uh, I can see both sides, you know. Um, but, but I'm very hopeful that we will continue to perform exceptionally well. We're just one of the strongest place university in the world. And what a privilege, what a pr prestige and honor to be here. Using those resources that you have here at your fingertips, what is the next big challenge that you'd like to tackle or the thing that's keeping you up at night now or getting you up out of bed every morning? You know, I, because I work on, on cities in developing countries, I, I, my one thought I have now is w how to manage this huge, huge uh, megalopolis. And there are millions, 18, 19, 20 million people many, many, many poor people, right? Um, how, what kind of planning would it take? And what the challenge is that we have figured out that planning of the old kind, which often people associate with the central planning like Soviet Union, you know, everything is planned, land is allocated, doesn't work. It, the, maybe your intentions is good, but that's not how administration, that's not how organizations work. That's not what flexibility is. So. What will it take? What kind of institution will it take? What kind of policies will it take to, ha to give these poor people uh, a better approach, better opportunity in life, that they could work, that the ki kids would go to school, that they would have a beautiful park to go to, um, that they have a cultural life? I think that's the, the whole world, if you look at the number of people who need that, is huge. That has to be a concern that we would like, that I would like to say I thought of that uh, as, as an approach. A second thing that I like very much is um, I, I like explanations that are, that are counterintuitive. 
I, I, I enjoy that immensely I, because I know the exp standard explanation. And so things that surprise me with a completely new explanation, whether it comes in a fiction or whether it comes in a research, that is very exciting for me. So I'm, I, I, I do get bored very quickly with things that we already know. Uh, and so you ag again hear the same thing again, and, and it's it, that I can't stand it. I just simply can't stand it. And I need, I need new, new things, new explanations. And, and Cambridge, not just MIT, but both Harvard, Cambridge, and the whole um, group of people that are here, um, they are very good in the way they they are asking all sorts of new questions about the human mind, which I think is an incredible frontier of work, of brain. And that's one thing I would have studied if I was undergraduate again. I, I, I would have done cognitive sciences, I think. Um, brain, uh, the relationship between human beings and social structures, the relationship between social structures and institutions. I mean, um, but the unit of analysis is the human being. And we are now, you know, through, through work on, on genomes, uh, the brain. I mean, look at how much more we could know about how, why we do what we do, right? So um, aesthetics, which again, let me end with it again, because I, that's something I, I, I still, concern about, I still um, value a lot. Uh, it will be interesting to know when we study the brain, uh, what aesthetics does to the brain. We know a little bit about what music does, because music is a s series of sounds, right? But what happens when you see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful river, right? And I think that um, what has happened to me at MIT is those uh, questions that I, I, that I loved to deal with when I was young, they're coming back to me through a different route now because of the work on, on science and technology. So, but I, I want to be able to blend, you know, to see, to, to make a, uh, some way explaining aesthetics in a, in a more scientific way. Uh, so if you weren't in your field now, would you be a cognitive scientist? What, what job do you think you'd be pursuing if you were? I would like to st study the brain. I think that excites me immensely as to what people are finding out um, and what we can do about it um, and, and um, how to be able to influence it. Now, the brain is not all hard wearing. And I, in a way, being in academia, I was always concerned about the brain because, right, how people think, and it. But I now, I'm now realizing that thinking has different elements to it. There is a hardware part of to it that we didn't understand as well before. We are just beginning to understand that. So if we can know that, and we can also know sort of learning environments and learning methods, uh, how to bring the two then you have somebody who should be in, in really be in the business of teaching, of, of, of teaching, helping people to learn. But learning is a central element of being in academia. We are in the business of learning, and we should know what that is. And we are just beginning to learn about learning, just beginning to learn how people, how people learn, why some people don't learn as fast, why, you know, what affects learning. So um, that's, I would say after, after urban planning, that's my second uh, very precious thing to, to follow. Your second career, if yes. there were to be one. Yes. yes. And you've obviously, you're very grateful for your path through MIT from the moment you got here. How would you say uh, the, the institution is doing in terms of welcoming foreign-born students and faculty into the fabric of the culture here today? I think they've done qu quite well. Um, I mean, if you look at the, no at the institute's faculty now, almost 30% are foreign-born faculty. Uh, and I think the students' body also, international students' body also, for the graduate students, is almost 40%. Undergraduates, we have a cap. We put a cap to 10% because yeah, we also fund them most cases, so we have limited funds for that. 
but uh, MIT, I think uh, Chuck Vest was the one who really explained it to me well. MIT owes a lot to international minds. Um, but it's true that MIT gave them the opportunity, uh, but they also gave back in terms of research, in terms of um, vibrancy. Uh, I think that that connection um, has been very important for MIT. The world came to MIT, and I wrote a piece for the once when I was the chair of the faculty because it, what surprised me a bit was MIT was making an effort to go abroad. So we are creating a campus in Singapore, in Abu Dhabi, in um, Russia now, and that's not bad. And also these are also very lucrative things. And when the institute is financially in trouble, you need money, right? And these are very well endowed efforts. But I was very struck that instead of the world coming to us, that we were beginning to go to the world selectively. And I was telling, and I wrote in my piece that we had had students come to MIT from, from abroad since 1873. I wanted to see a center at MIT that a building that would be sort of a global center, right? That, uh, that we could have uh, languages being taught. So one floor could be languages. One could be research of on developing countries, all these technological things we are producing. One could be an international cafe that we have. I mean, we have the resources. Uh, there was a lot of support for it when I presented it to the Academic Council. But then people say, well, we have other things to do right now. So I think that um, MIT's engagement with the world, what form would it take? What institutional form will it take is an issue to be thought through more. I think we cannot afford to just go in places that are giving us money. I don't think it will be good for our reputation in the long run. Our, the respect that we have, if we start squandering that respect by going to places th that are just giving us money, but not really good research is coming out of that, it will hurt. So um, the work we are doing in, in Abu Dhabi or, or in other places, so in, even in Singapore, we have created a new center for design. I think we should watch very carefully what, what is the research. And is the research really cutting edge research, you know? But um, I see the administration very concerned about it. The MIT created two uh, ad hoc committees to look into this, our relationship in the world, and what sh we should be teaching our students about the world. I was in both committees. And so, not that we came up with very firm answers, but uh, it told me that a good group of people are worrying about it. And, but we still don't have a concrete, fixed answer, I think, as yet. So for MIT's next 150 years, um, what are the few issues that you would like to see the, the institution you know, really, really set its sights on? Is it access? Is it this more global perspective? Or is there another topic that you think has yet to be, on te you know, yet to be researched? Yeah, I think... Um, the idea of excellence and access, um, some people have portrayed it as a, as a trade-off. I think we have to do both. And I think there is a way to do both. And have the access of average people, brilliant, but average, who cannot afford to pay this very high tuition. At the same time, um, the excellence of the research. We cannot compromise. On, on excellence. That's our reputation is excellence. But I think that as the world changes, um, uh, I think the, the political economy is changing. No? And so we need to keep, to keep that access of people. We have been pretty good. I have to say we have been pretty good. And as I told you, the statistics, if we look at even now, how many students come from these kind of families? I mean, it's admirable. And in from obscure places, small towns in, in that I have never even heard of, and and there this kid is you know full of energy, talking, saying th things in class. I think we should keep that, and we yes, the world will come, and we can go to the world and do joint research project. I think research, the way scientific research is going now, it's become very expensive. The U.S. do not have monopoly over those research centers anymore. A lot of good research centers are in Europe. 
because Europeans are v have invested a lot. American government has not invested as much as European governments because most of cases MIT has been private, right? And I think that a um, lot of research, I think in the future will be done collaboratively. And so um, the challenge is, I think, uh, when we get involved in this research, how are we going to divide the intellectual property? Because intellectual property rights is very central question. And I think we need to, we don't exactly know the rules. The rules are changing because the situation is changing. But if you think of a cooperative research, we also have to think of new rules of who will get credit for what, what will be the investment. And those kind of things will take us as uh, scientists into a different domain of conversation. How much do you see MIT being a leader in that evolution? Seems like the perfect place to help make those rules. I think MIT is playing a role, and, and our vice president of research, Claude Canizares, is very aware of it. But so are other places. If we look at patents, etc., Europeans are also quite aware because they are producing good stuff. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you heard, it was Scotland, they produced the first, um, you know, where they first done the, the uh, mimicking the uh, dolly, ship dolly. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they invented something else for doing work. And I thought, that's very interesting. It's coming from Scotland. And so they will also, they're also going to ask for this, their share of the intellectual property. So I think we need a new, new round of conversation. We need a new round of conversation, and this will ultimately link us to the larger issue of where the United States is vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So MIT is, MIT is an American institution. It is true it's a global, but it is still the United States, right? That's where it is based. And so our, I think our president understands that. I think, but you need new presidents, new provosts who are who in the future who will understand the kind of uh, importance of those issues. It's no more just inventing in your own lab. We are working in a very different world and we have to work with other people. Uh, and at the same time, we need to protect our share of things that we put into so that our, you know, we, can, we can run this place well. But it's a geopolitical question. And, the, and that MIT has a unique position in leading those discussions. A lot, you know why? Because l people trust MIT. They have, incre this is goes to the issue of this reputation. There is something about this engineer and scientist that they think these people are really after truth. These are not people who are fabricating things. And this retaining this sense of trust in a global form is an immense responsibility for us. And I think you need a set of faculty and administration who can really be trusted at the global level. People say, yeah, this, if this person is saying this, I trust it, right? So imagine the level of responsibility that, that we are asked to shoulder. And I think that that's why hiring the best people and bringing the best students, not just best intellectually, but morally, who if they say something, they stick to it, they say that the, what is the real truth, right? And I, don't, I think it's a big, big responsibility in a world when there is a huge amount of distrust, huge amount of, of um, uh, misunderstanding, uh, to have a voice that you say, oh, that's Professor of MIT is saying that? That must be true. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's been my pleasure. <laughs>